YouTube, how's it going? And welcome to Meta Monday. Uh, this is episode four of Meta Monday, and I'm super excited to keep doing this each week. It's like one of my favorite segments because I just always choose a topic. We always go into big discussion about it, talk about it, and I love hearing from you guys in the comment section below. Now, in this week, we're going to do uh, Meta Monday number four is going to be about lessons we learned from set one. And in my opinion, this is a very important topic to discuss because all we, every time you learn something from a set or from a group of cards, it's always important to take those lessons and uh, apply them in set two, uh, especially with the first set of the game. It's always the most important because that's the set that everyone's figuring out the game. They're figuring out the mechanics. They're figuring out you know what's good, what's bad. And we've learned a lot. Uh, from this set, uh, and I can't wait to kind of share them with you. And so anyway, without further ado, let's go on to the first topic, uh, which is number one, and I think the most important thing that you can talk about when you learn, or the, the I guess the most important thing you learn from set one, and that is card advantage is king. And what I mean by that is a lot of the times I think players look at their life. I've noticed a lot of new players look at their life and think this, you know, the life is my, is my lifeline, right? Like that's what I should be the most uh, concerned about. And, and I always tell new players that actually your lifeline, the, the thing that you know all, often determines if you win or lose is your hand. You know, there's no maximum hand size in this game. And honestly, almost everything that you do in this game comes from your hand. You know, it's, it's a kind of the heart of your, um, of your play experience, right? You know, if it dies, then you lose, right, essentially. Um, and so a lot of the times, um, you know, what we talk about is I'll play it like if I play out something. Let's say I play like a battle card and it dies. Um, or, or you attack it, someone threatens the battle card. I've seen a lot of players use multiple cards, you know, like three, four cards to keep it alive. You know, they'll combo up super high for no reason. Um, you know, usually the combo is kind of the biggest thing that new players kind of miss, you know, uh, their biggest play mistake. And honestly, all you're doing is you're killing that lifeline, right? If you could almost pretend that every time you comboed or every time you kept something alive, if it, if it took a life to do it, would you still do it? And I think that's a really important thing to kind of remember is that, you know, you, you do have a limited amount of cards in your hand and each one that you use out of your hand for a combo or for an extra action uh, or for, you know, as just to play out as a battle card, you know, should really have a purpose, should have some sort of game plan. Because if, if it doesn't, then it should just stay in your hand, right? Because it's almost more important in your hand uh, than anywhere else. Uh, the same thing happens with energy. I see a lot of person, I'm, and I, I, I was almost going to make this just another point in itself. But I've seen a lot of people, they'll have eight, nine energy, and they'll just be like, cool, I'll play an energy. It's almost like they get into a rhythm, right? They just play a card out of their hand. They're like, oh, energy, energy, every turn, energy, energy. And sometimes you don't need another energy. Sometimes you can just stop at five. And what that does is that just gives you an extra card on hand. And again, remember, card advantage is king. And sometimes if you cut energy to get an extra card in your hand, it can really make a difference in a battle that's coming up uh, or even, you know, uh, it to finish the game. You know, it gives you an extra card to combo with. Uh, and so, like I said, just remember, guys, that, you know, if you run out of cards in your hand, if you, if it, if you let your cards run out or you're, or you're like, you know, I guess using cards without out of your hand without a reason or without a plan, uh, a lot of times that's going to lead to you losing a game. Almost all the games I lose, I can I can almost track back to just bad hand management. You know, I made a bad play. I used too many combo cards when I thought I could win, um, or I played you know too many energy when I thought I might need them. And also often that again just just leads to me losing the game. Okay, so let's move off to the next thing that we learn uh, from set one, and that is you need to have a plan to awaken. And I've talked about this a lot when I, especially when I talk about the leader spoolers in the set, and I always think, oh, this this healer, this healer, this leader doesn't have um, a way to awaken. He's probably pretty bad, or, you know, or you know, hey, you know, you're going to be stuck in you know your your front side, so the front side ability has to be really really powerful. And and the reason why I always say that is because awakening is probably one of the most important things that we can do in the game from our leader standpoint, and we always have to have a plan or have an idea of how we're going to do that with our with our leader. And if we don't, uh, then we're very um, we're, we're very open to stalling. We're very open for our opponents to take advantage of the fact that we don't have a plan to awaken. And it can literally put us in a really bad situation, often just make us lose the game in general. So uh, a couple ways you can have plans. And I like I talk about all the time, I think that's why Vegeta and Ginyu are probably the most uh, are the strongest leaders in the current set is because they just have kind of built-in ways to awaken. And we're going to see some other leaders in set two that also have that ability, which is really important. And these leaders are always going to be strong because essentially they don't have to have a, a plan built into the deck. And that can a lot of the times give them uh, more open options in their deck, you know, in deck building. They don't have to put in maybe bad cards to awaken. Um, so that's one way. That's like the number one way to do it, right? You just have a have a, have a leader that can do it. Uh, the second way is to you know use um, a card that, can, that that affects your life. And so you know we've seen some some cards coming out in set two. We currently have ones like Kaba is a good example. We also have 
um, TN that's, that got spoiled. Let's just take cards out. Another popular one is uh, Furious El Vegeta is another way we can awaken our leaders, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, and then we also have like extra cards, uh, which is the only one we have currently is Result of Training. But Result of Training is a great way uh, to just awaken, right? You have to do it to, on turn five, uh, which is a little slow. And honestly, you know, once we get uh, hand destruction decks, a lot of times can take that card out of your hand uh, before you can use it, uh, especially if they have good draws and they're very quick. Uh, so just remember, you know, it's a big a lesson we learn in, in set two, and that is to make sure that we have a plan to awaken. Anytime that you look at your decks, you know, I think my favorite example is with my most recent deck with my, uh, my Galactic Emperor aggro deck. Uh, you know, I have like multiple ways in that deck to awaken, but none of them are, I, mean, I wouldn't say none of them, but most of them are kind of, they're, they're hard to notice, I guess. And that can give your opponent a hard way to play around it. And so, for example, I have Kaba in the deck, and the deck can protect Kaba as well. And so, you know, oftentimes I just awaken by using Kaba. But also, the, because Frieza protects his his battle cards, um, you know, the opponent, if they want to um, attack my leader, they have, I mean, if they want to put pressure on me, they have to attack my leader, which awakens me. Um, and so, again, remember... You know, just there's multiple ways to awaken other than using the cards or, you know, you can also, you know, essentially uh, make your strategy uh, a way to awaken. You know, you can essentially not play out battle cards and just have your only target be your leader and then maybe uh, run a bunch of um, kill spells, like kill, uh, kill extra spells. We've seen a lot more kill spells available in the new set. So just think outside the box, but make sure you always have a way to awaken because if you don't, you're going to get stalled out and, you know, you're not going to have a very good time. And honestly, when you awaken, it just adds so much card advantage to you, to you that, again, remember, card advantage is king that's number one and number two is make sure you can awaken so you can get that card advantage okay number three says uh we what one thing i like to talk about here is like be ready for powerful extra cards and originally what this what this bullet point was going to be was um you know pl play around cold bloodlust right like have a way to to, to play around cold bloodlust but honestly the more and more i think about it you know i think there's a lot of extra cards that we haven't seen I mean, the, the, we, the, you know, because when we first got into set one, people weren't really talking about Cold Bloodlust. And, you know, I think it was it went underneath the radar a little bit because it was kind of hard to use, kind of hard to fit into a deck. I think the power of Ginyu, I think the power of Awakening kind of, you know, again, you know, wasn't really on our radar at the start. And so, uh, you know, th this can evolve. And I want to talk about a couple of different extra cards in set one that you need to be prepared for going into set two and also a lesson you should learn from. And so obviously, number one, we're going to talk about is Cold Bloodlust. It's very important that you find a way to play around this card and that you don't rely on like one big guy coming out uh, that just you know, it's going to win you the game. Uh, one of my favorite examples is like Beerus, right? A lot of people feel like if they just play Beerus out and they swing that they're going to essentially win the game, right? Uh, the Vegeta Hand Destruction, you know, the deck I built for Gen Con, um, you know, is that kind of deck, right? It just wants to discard your hand with these powerful cards and then it plays out Beerus and wins. Um, if you if you kind of only have your, your, your deck built around that one threat, um, or, you know, maybe a series of, a series of big threats, then you're going to get blown out by Cold Bloodlust. And so, you know, going forward in set two and a lesson that we've learned in set one is to make sure we have multiple threats in our deck. Make sure we have maybe some three drop threats. And so we can play around Bloodlust. We can put out, you know, threats that they, you know, have to Cold Bloodlust early and then we can win with our later, you know, uh, threats or just have multiple later threats so they can't possibly Cold Bloodlust them all. Either way, ever how you want to attack this card, you need to have a plan to be ready for that card. Another one is Crusher Ball. Uh, very similar uh, in that way where you know it, it can essentially you play out a big threat they crush or ball it again there's multiple ways we can get around this by playing early threats um you know earlier in the in, in the game and, and then you know so they want to kind of crusher ball those and then finish with our big threats this is always a, a very good strategy against the crusher ball cold ballast um but something else is you know cards like uh, raging kaba for example get around cold ballast as well um and then there's also um i'm sorry cold ballast uh they get around crusher ball uh also you know, making sure that if they sometimes just if they have a, a, a yellow energy open, just not playing into it can be something else that you can do, right? Just put them in a situation where, you know, if you already have threats out in the field, you know, you don't always have to play another threat every turn. Again, remember, card advantage is king. And so sometimes, you know, you don't have to play the fourth, fifth, sixth threat. You can just keep your threats out, make them deal with it. And if they can't, uh, you know, there's no reason to play something out and get a crusher ball, for example. It, it, essentially, because like crusher ball is a dead card in their hand unless they hit it, you know, hit you with something, unless they hit a card with it and they can kill it on the next turn or do something, you know, with it. So if you can just, you know, make them have to kind of keep it in their hand, it's something that you can really take advantage of. Another really powerful extra card that we haven't talked too much about in set one, uh, which is surprising to me, is Sensu Bean. Uh, to me, it's you know probably the second best card in the game uh, next to Cold Ball Lust. Uh, and I just really feel like that it's a card that I see a lot of people get play into a lot. You know, they'll say, oh, my opponent only has one energy open, you know, so I'm just going to attack with this, this attacker and I'm going to buff him up. You know, again, card advantage is king. I'm going to use all these cards and like there's no way they can stop it. They have one, one energy up. 
And then their opponent's just like, cool, Sensu being ready to, Sensu being ready to more, and then tap all four and play out all my guys and stop it. And now they lose the next turn because they don't have a hand. I've seen a lot of people get blown out by Sensu being, and it's one of those things where, you know, you have to be ready to play around those cards. You have to remember that these cards are in the game uh, and really, you know, kind of play around them. Another card that I've noticed that I've seen people get played into a lot, especially at my last event, was Kaba's Awakening. It's just a zero cost plus 6,000. A lot of times people don't think about that card. They'll think about the plus 10,000 cards, but they don't think about that card. And so that's always something to remember when you're playing against red, kind of, you know, uh, be ready for that card. I don't think that card is extremely powerful, but I do think it's important, you know, and maybe this seg this bullet point should have been just, you know, we've learned how to play around, you know, more extra powerful cards. But as I, what I'm just trying to tell you guys is be ready for these powerful extra cards and always remember that, you know, whenever you see energy open, one thing I always like to do is when I see an opponent with energy open, I always imagine what they're going to have in their hand and then try to play around that effect. So again, if they have one blue open, I just assume they have Sensu being. If they have one yellow open, I just assume they have either Crusher Ball or Cold Blood Lust, ever which one's going to kill me uh, or, or I guess make it harder for me to win or lose or whatever. Okay, so the next bullet point I want to talk about is Hand Destruction is Real. Now, this is a deck that, you know, I made for Gen Con, and, you know, I actually feel like I was one of the first, you know, uh, players to build the deck, you know, again. And then after the after the tournament, you know, honestly, it was so funny because I was at that event, um, you know, I just kind of breezed through all my opponents. It was a very easy game. The only game that I lost was due to a horrible play mistake by me, uh, where essentially I played Beerus on seven, uh, tapped out. I had no, no energy. I had three counters in hand. I attacked my opponent. I blew up his board. I blew up his energy. Uh, and then he proceeded to um, draw his three cards from the Beerus attack, drew his card on his turn, awakened, drew two more cards, attacked with his leader, drew a card, and then all the cards in his hand were zero cost cards. And he had all four zero plus 10,000 cards, and so he just buffed his leader up to a million and killed me. Uh, the funny thing was, that was the only damage he got through the whole game. I actually did, took all that, all my damage from Vegeta just to draw extra cards. And so that's another huge play mistake I made. Uh, and so honestly, I feel like hand destruction, honestly, one of the ways it loses most of the time is because you mess up, right? And honestly, I, I think when we I first built the deck, and again, after I built the deck, the judges came over. I remember even after that match, the judges came over. We had a big discussion about hand destruction and stuff. And it was really funny because they assured me they had some ways to, to stop it and like kind of improve improve um on defense against it going into set two and they were 100 percent right I and mean, we have tons of stuff in set two that's really going to make hand destruction hat struggle but we also have some things in set two that's going to make hand destruction in my opinion a little bit better so it's not definitely not going to go away and that's kind of why i want to put this segment in it's super strong the last big tournament we just saw which was um i think there's 32 pl players at um i think the bearded collectibles um and they, I think top two out of those were both hand destruction decks. I think there was four in top eight. And so this deck is very important and it's something we have to learn to play around because it is, because card advantage is king, it is a very strong archetype and it's only going to get stronger as these sets come out. And so we really have to have a way to play around this. You need to understand the ones that are, are, are important. In set one, it was Vegeta hand destruction. Uh, you have to understand, you know, what that deck is weak to. It's weak to its... Um, it's Broly's being killed. It's weak for you playing low energy. If you don't play that much energy out, you actually have extra cards in your hand to discard. And a lot of times you can come back and, and win through that. Uh, it's it's weak to consistent aggression that it can't stop. There's a, that deck. The deck has a lot of uh, weak points and we have to understand those, attack them and be able to defeat, defeat it going into the set too. It's just, you know, it's in my opinion, the hand destruction is probably the best deck in the game. Uh, it's it, If not, it's probably the best archetype in the game. Um, and so, you know, for set one. And so we just have to be understand, you know, make sure you're aware of that uh, going into set two. Okay, and the last point I want to talk about is, uh, and I think this is something I struggle with all the time. I think this is probably my biggest weakness, and it's something I'm always talking about with my with my team, and that is knowing when to attack is important. And that's something that's a lot different than a lot of other games. And what I mean by that is in a lot of games that we play, I feel like attacking is almost always correct, right? There's never a time where not attacking is a good idea. You know, in Magic and Pokemon and, um, you know, uh, Star Wars Destiny is our game I play. You know, th there's very few times where you have a guy or you have a powerful threat and you just go, I'll pass turn. You know, especially if all you guys have haste. It just seems like in this game that you should attack every single turn. But however, in, in uh, Dragon Ball, the thing is, is that every time you attack your opponent, you're getting them closer to their awakened state, which is a huge card advantage. And unless you're attacking with a critical attacker, you're also giving them cards every turn. And so it's really important to understand when you need to attack. Some decks want to attack early. Obviously, aggro decks want to attack early. Now, other decks like mid-range decks, they want to get out threats and attack you in the mid game, like around six or seven, 
Uh, well, actually, that's probably, yeah, like, I'd have to say around six or seven energy. Uh, or I'd say, not even the energy, just like essentially, I guess, turn six or seven. Uh, they want to start attacking you with multiple threats, like multiple double strikers. You know, the Gotenks is a perfect example. If we take the green, uh, blue Go uh, Goku deck, the starter deck uh, Goku, and think, you know, they want to play Goku. I mean, sorry, Gotenks, ready to attack, play out like a Beerus, kill your dude. Next turn, play out like a Vegeta, maybe another Gotenks, and just wait until they have like four or five threats, and then they'll attack you with everything. And just make it like you might awaken but then you have to struggle to like continue to survive and so essentially what they want to do is make it so when they awaken you you have to use the cards that you just awaken with to survive so it's almost like you didn't awaken if that makes sense they're trying to get your cards out of that way and then you have decks like you know car uh, hand destruction something we just talked about where they don't want to attack you at all they don't want to give you cards at all so they just play out powerful into the battle effect uh you know battle cards strip your hand away and then want to kill you you know with like something like beerus a powerful threat and then we also have like um control decks that you know or stall decks i guess they want to get you to like five or maybe six you know if, if they think you might have something like fury tail vegeta or kaba to awaken with and they just want to set back and then beat you with a big powerful threat you know uh which is often like a six or seven drop or maybe even a 12 drop we you know that's kind of how that deck wants to play too and so you know you need to know what your deck wants to do and then to figure out how to attacking because attacking every turn isn't this isn't the key to victory in this game like it is in a lot of other games and so it's really important to understand that you know that's something i think that we all learned from set one was that uh you know attacking into your opponent actually kind of sucks <laughs> like it's very it's very uh, it can definitely make you lose the game I, I would say there's multiple games i lose you know a daily uh because i just attacked my opponent at the wrong time and i awakened them too soon or awakened them you know at a, at a bad point or sometimes i i just don't awaken them too like I, I would say another big lesson with this is that like if you think your opponent has a resolve of training uh then you need to be attacking them right because you don't want to uh, you don't want them to awaken at eight life and then blow you out that way and so there's so many different um you know paths that we can take with this and so like i said just really make sure you sit down with your deck and really come up with a strategy against different leaders you know when do you want to attack and when is it the most important time to for your deck all right guys so that's it for my meta monday number four and like i said i love this topic this is something i love talking about i just love sitting down and talking about game theory in general uh it's something that i actually might start doing with the channel a little bit more just in very just in game design just talking a little bit more about game design theory and you know uh, essentially balance and other games or just you know in general uh it's just something i love talking about i've always been you know i've always loved to talk about game theory it's always been so much fun to me so i hope you like this series uh, if you guys have any suggestions for a future series uh let me know i do know that next week i'm going to do uh a really fun meta money that I've had tons of people ask me about and that's uh they ask you know you know how do I come up with my deck ideas how do I build my decks and I think it's a very fun topic and something I really want to talk about so next meta Monday will be um essentially how to build a competitive deck going into set two I'm going to talk about you know when you see the new cards and you know, kind of what to think about and how I what goes through my mind whenever I create uh I guess competitive lists so all right guys thanks again for watching uh again thank you so much for the support you guys blow me away honestly the last couple days I haven't had a chance to make videos i've been super busy and uh honestly you know i still get subscribers i still get comments and you guys tell me how much you like my videos i still get support it's just amazing to me you know i just you guys just never let me down and thank you so much again for being there for me it really means a lot so i'll see you guys tomorrow for top five tuesday and i hope you guys have a wonderful monday i'll see you next time